will <laughs> be captured on Facebook. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lena Montoya. I am the founder and CEO at Aliento. We're very excited to start uh, this day on June 28th of 2021. Uh, 20 year celebrations is the very first ever Dream Act hearing that occurred in the US Senate. It's been 20 years since the very first Dream at hearing, as I was mentioning, and then, uh, and then another. Um, it's been twenty years since it was actually introduced. Ten years since the very first Dream at hearing. I have to get my facts right. Um, I got a little bit uh, nervous, but we're super excited to be hosting this roundtable discussion about twenty years of uncertainty in order to really provide context about what this means for dreamers, DACA recipients, undocumented students, and formerly on. Um, formerly undocumented folks, we're going to be having a, a great panel discussion where we're going to be sharing that. So we're going to be uh, kick starting with that. And with that, we're going to be hearing some remarks from uh, US Senator Durbin, who has been one of the champions of immigration. And before of that, I know we have so many people joining today's discussion, and we wanted to show gratitude for being here today. It is really important. It's deeply personal for us to be living with this uncertainty and want to especially acknowledge our both U.S. Senators here in the state of Arizona that have some representation, U.S. Senator Cinema and U.S. Senator Kelly. Uh, staff members are joining us today for this conversation as well the mayor, uh, mayor of Tempe who's going to be joining and listening, Mayor Woods. So thank you so much for being here today and deep gratitude for for the panelists who are really gonna showcase what 20 years means 20 years it's said lightly but at that time i was only 10 years old and so much has happened since then so thank you so much for joining us today and we're gonna be starting with the remarks of u.s senator um, durbin And that's what's really the key word when it comes to DACA. It's temporary. When President Obama first announced it, he said, because this is temporary, Congress needs to act. There's still time for Congress to pass the DREAM Act this year, he said, because these kids deserve to plan their lives in more than two-year increments. Well, that year has turned into nine years. Over the years, the DREAM Act has been a victim of a filibuster on the floor of the Senate five different times. As the DREAM Act has languished in the Senate, hundreds of thousands of young people have been left with their futures in doubt. But that hasn't stopped them from fighting for their dreams and giving everything they can to this country. It has been my honor to be the voice of the dreamers for 20 years. Dreamers have taught children in our nation's classrooms, dazzled audiences at world-class music venues like Carnegie Hall, fought in American wars, and have started American businesses. During the past year, as our nation was ravaged by a pandemic, and we were cheering on the healthcare heroes who risked their lives for us every minute of every day, dreamers were saving American lives. According to the classification used by President Trump, more than 200,000 DACA recipients are essential, critical infrastructure workers. Among them are thousands of frontline health care workers, doctors, intensive care nurses, paramedics, respiratory therapists, just like them. DACA and TPS recipients and their households contribute an estimated $17.4 billion in federal taxes and $9.7 billion in state and local taxes every single year. 
By enacting the Dream and Promise Act, we can increase our nation's GDP by an estimated $799 billion over 10 years and create more than 285,000 new jobs. There is a mistaken notion that we have a static number of jobs in America and we all have to fight over them. We are finding that by bringing talented people in to serve this country and to create businesses, we actually have a dynamic that increases the size of employment in our economy. We need a functioning immigration system that welcomes immigrants so we can grow our economy and put America on track to be a winner in the 21st century. The challenges we face at the border are no excuse for inaction. I've spoken to Senator Cornyn and uh, Senator Sinema about the southern border. We are not going to ignore that reality, but this is a reality as well. There is no excuse for inaction. For too many years, Congress has looked the other way and found another excuse to put off this decision. It's time to allow these individuals, these future Americans, to finally become American citizens. That's why we must join the House in passing <clears throat> the Dream and Promise Act. And as Senator Durbin ended the conversation, it is time for us to have a solution. It's been time for so long and we cannot let inaction be the motivator on this. We're talking about human lives. And in order to really talk about those 20 years of uncertainty, we have to remember that we're not alone, that there is a vast majority of American voters that support a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And beyond that, we know that there's economic and societal benefits for our community because with one of us thrives, we all of us thrive. And with that said, it is my honor to introduce Lisa Urias, who is the Chief Program and Community Engagement Officer at the Arizona Community Foundation. The Arizona Community Foundation has been a supporter of so many different causes that make Arizona thrive. And it is my honor to pass it over to Lisa, who's gonna be engaging in this thoughtful, purposeful and much needed conversation with our dreamers. Lisa, take it away now. Gracias, Reina. Buenos dias a todos. Bienvenidos. Thank you all for being here today. It's such an honor to be here to present this beautiful panel of dreamers that you'll hear from today. I mean, just imagine what it's like to live without a passport. You're not able to travel out of country. You may be ineligible for a driver's license or in-state tuition, and all because you're subject to circumstances beyond your control. You have no real alliance to your country of birth because you were brought to the United States from the time you were a child. And yet you're not a citizen of this country with the full rights and responsibilities associated with that status. And the United States of America is the only country you really know. It's the place you grew up in, went to school in, you contributed in your community, and yet you find yourself largely in limbo. So despite the unfairness and absolute lack of equity, these young people you're gonna hear from today and their families make significant contributions to this country. According to the Center for American Progress, Dreamers and DACA recipient households pay 5.7 billion in federal taxes each year and 3.1 billion in state and local taxes. And despite having little to no support from national or state government due to their status, Dreamers and their families make significant contributions to our nation every day. Immigrants eligible for the DREAM Act own 5,800 homes in Arizona. They are more than 200 DACA recipients are essential, critical, and infrastructure workers. As you heard from Senator Durbin, many of those are frontline healthcare workers, doctors, intensive care workers, paramedics, respiratory therapists. And while these are just statistics, there's far more than economic numbers to the contribution of our American dreamers. These young people are intelligent, resilient, thoughtful, and make contributions to our state and nation every day. So today I have the pleasure of moderating a panel of these young dreamers. So now you'll meet them firsthand. Ola Caso is the Senior Regulatory Oversight Analyst in Medicaid programs. She was brought to the United States by her mother from Albania in 1998 when she was five years old. She's completed a double major in biochemistry and women's studies and wants to go to medical school. She's become 
involved in nanotechnology, a cutting edge field that holds great promise for future technological breakthroughs and plans to attend medical school to become an oncologist. She's accomplished all of this without any government support due to her status. She is not eligible for Pell Grants or any student loans. Yadira Nayeli Garcia Apodaca is a math teacher at Carl Hayden High School. La Naye, as her family calls her, came to the United States when she was seven years old from the, our neighboring state of Sonora. She crossed the border with her mom to reconcile with her father. La Naye is the first one in her family to attend college. She excelled in high school and realizing she was undocumented, she became an advocate for immigrant rights in her senior year. She graduated from ASU and in 2015, she decided to teach math at her former high school. She's currently preparing our youth for college and within the workforce to support our Achieve 60 Arizona goal. She's married and has a five-year-old son. Angel Palazuelos is a Barrett Honors College student at Arizona State University. He migrated to the country with his mother and older brother when he was just six years old in June of 2007, just a couple of days after the DACA deadline. His single mother <clears throat> supports him and his older brother. Angel and his brother are both studying mechanical engineering. He is a Golden Door Scholar and a recipient of the US of the Dream US Scholarship. He also has a support puppy named Sirius. And Jose Patino, an Education and External Affairs Director for Aliento. Jose was born in Mexico and migrated to the US at the age of six with his family and is part of the 1% documented people in the US with a master's degree. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Arizona State University and a master's degree in secondary education from Grand Canyon University. Jose became involved in immigrant rights and the dreamer movement in 2009. And he's been working against injustices that undocumented immigrants face every day. Due to his tireless efforts, he has been featured in the Washington Post, MSNBC, NPR, Univision, Telemundo, BuzzFeed, Think Progress, as well as in the documentaries, The Dream Is Now and Underwater Dreams. <clears throat> Finally, Michael Nasario from the US Armed Services. Michael came to the United States as a child with his parents when he was six years old and grew up in Maryvale. Michael's personal dream was to serve as a soldier in the US Armed Services, but found himself ineligible due to his immigration status. Once the DACA program was announced in 2012, he became a DACA recipient and applied for the US Army. He's been serving in the US Army since that time and is coming to us today from where he is stationed in South Korea. Michael, let's start with you. Your dream was to serve this country, the only country you know as your home and enlist in the US Marine Corps. However, due to your immigration status, you weren't eligible to join the service. What was it like to know initially that you couldn't serve? And what, why is it so important for you to give back to this country through military service? First and foremost, uh, good morning, everybody stateside. Um, I, I want to reflect now on the last uh, 10 plus years uh, since we became involved here in the movement. Uh, I initially uh, joined in 2010 uh, once the, the fight in Arizona uh, was uh, at its peak uh, for immigrants rights advocacy. But uh, I became eligible here for, for DACA and uh, married my wife, my spouse, uh, a US citizen. I was able to apply for advanced parole had a legal entry and I was able to apply for my permanent residency and ultimately I earned my citizenship here in the last uh, four years. But um, uh, for me personally, I think uh, it was always about doing the right thing, the uh, moral, ethical, civic duty that uh, calls me for, for the military service. There is uh, underlying values in the military that we talk about, uh, core values that, that uh, bring us uh, as service members together and uh, the reality is that once I, I reflect on this, right, um, the movement itself and, and the people organizing right now, my my friends organizing stateside for immigration reform, for for expanded uh, rights for our immigrant community, are doing the exact same thing, and, and those values are under our underlying voices at the end of the day. Uh, 
I, and that's what pushed me always to be to to be to be active and, and want to join the military. I always wanted to provide something back to my country in a uh, in a service manner. But uh, uh, it's been a, it's been a very difficult last uh, 10 years for a fact. I know this has affected many, many uh, of our dreamers or our immigrant families uh, mentally, spiritually. Uh, but if there's one thing that I can say is that our community is resilient. Our community is resilient and tough. And, and that uh, transcends throughout the years. So for me, uh, the military service and, and the civic duty goes beyond putting on a uniform. Uh, it's about doing uh, the right and ethical thing for our communities. Michael, you're so right. Such a beautiful, resilient community that we are. And that's demonstrated in all of you. Um, Yadira, I'd like to go to you. Um, you excelled in high school and ended up the first in your family with a college degree. What made you want to teach math, especially in the same high school where you attended? And how do you think you're making a contribution to those students? Sorry, Yadira, we're having a little trouble hearing you. <laughs> Not yet. I'm gonna maybe move to the next person and then we'll come back to you and hopefully get that fixed. Uh, Jose, you have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and master's in secondary education, but once you graduated as an engineer, you couldn't work as a mechanical engineer because of your immigration status. And what did you do? What was the most difficult part of not being able to practice in the profession that you studied? Um. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, and it's, it's actually really good to see some of these people that I haven't seen in, in years. Um, I think that the most difficult part was, the, uh, I felt like I let my, my parents down. Um, I felt like I let my, my, my family down just because they made so many sacrifices for me to, to have this opportunity. I'm, I'm the youngest of four. Uh, I was the first one to go to college and had that opportunity. So um, that was that was really difficult. Um, just every day seeing their faces, and I felt like I let them down. So I needed to do something. Um, and my mom always told me, like, um, don't swell on your on your sorrows. You got to get up and go out and fight for it. Um, and I just remember how how we came to the country with, with nothing, and she just kept fighting. Uh, and in, and all every single day, just wake up at three a.m. the morning, make sure that we went to school, make sure that she made food, and make sure that. My dad was working, so um, I, I was always just went back to that. What would my mom do? Uh, and that just kept motivating me to to keep fighting. Uh, and it was difficult when you would see on, on social media your friends doing internships or working uh, in the companies that you would want to. Uh, but I just kept uh, kept kept. I'm like, I'm gonna find something. Maybe this path won't be for me, but something else will come. Uh, and thankfully, I've been able to have so many blessings, uh, being able to be an educator, being able to, to help the community, be able to know some amazing people who are in this panel that I'm so grateful for. And uh, I'm just really grateful uh, for the opportunity that I've had. Well, and you're doing so much, and we'll learn a little bit more about that as well. So thank you, Jose. Yadira, are we, are we up? No. Try it, maybe. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Wonderful. Oh, so, you, <laughs> so tell us about um, what drove you to teach math in your high school. Is it Carl Hayden High School? Carl Hayden High School, yeah. Tell us about. Well, say and I are alumni. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so, I mean, um, I was just really good at math when I first started. I always had like the little oh, I want to be a teacher type of thing, but it wasn't really something, you know, that I wanted to pursue because I was so good at math. I kind of got pushed to like the engineering uh, path. And I did actually study engineering my freshman year, but then I took a course in teaching to fulfill like one of my other requirements. And I was like, okay, this is where it's at. So I kind of just went back uh, and switch majors to teaching um, math just because math came easy to me really was kind of why that ended up being it. Um, but yeah, so I started teaching in the district actually while I was still doing uh, nonprofit work. I became a substitute first because I didn't want to get away from the field because I knew eventually I wanted to return. Um, 
And then I just ended up at Carhaden three years ago. Prior to that, I did two years in another high school. Um, but it's really fun, you know, just being there. Um, whenever I introduce myself at the beginning of the year, I always make sure to make it a point uh, to let them know that I am a DACA recipient and a dreamer because a lot of our students don't think that anybody relates to them, you know, especially in the community that I teach. I know firsthand their struggles. And even if it's not, you know, coming from a mixed status family, uh, if they're the ones that are documented, then they still have probably parents or theos or theas uh, who are undocumented and they still have that fear uh, of having a mixed status family. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think that's they benefit so important. from it. Um, sometimes some of them do approach me and they tell me, you know, oh, miss, you have DACA, my sister does or something, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, if you guys ever need help, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I think that representation really makes such a difference. And thank you for making sure that your students know that. I mean, the, you know, the term mixed status families is something people should know about because we have neglected our immigration system for so long. We have lots and lots of families that are in that mixed status state. So it's obviously really important to, to address that. Um, let's go to Angel, uh, Angel, he says. <laughs> Don't call me Angel, call me Angel. <laughs> Angel, I understand that you don't currently qualify for DACA. Is that correct? And what would you say are the most difficult things about being undocumented? And how do you think this impacts you and, and your, your brother, I think, is also undocumented, if that's correct, or not a DACA recipient? How does it impact you? Uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, it's an honor to be here. And no, actually, my brother and I did not qualify for DACA. A lot of my friends um, that have no recollection of their native land, they contribute to society and call Arizona their home, as it is their home. It's the only home that they know to not qualify for DACA. And for those of you who don't know, one of the terms to be eligible for DACA is having resided in the US before June 15, 2007. I like to call that the magic number, one, because it just feels arbitrary to me, and two, it's because it gatekeeps dreamers from following their dreams. The last time my family and I entered the US was actually three days after that deadline, which made me ineligible. And still, I'm super frustrated at the fact that for three days, in society's eyes, I'm deemed less than um, kind of unworthy, like I should not have to validate my existence at every corner, yet I do because I'm scared, like scared to not be the person that I know I can be, scared to not have honored my mother's sacrifices, and scared that um, everything that I have worked so hard for, and that despite my contributions and accomplishments, would be compromised. And with that being said, one of the most dangerous and difficult thing in society revolving this issue is society's political inability to differentiate between being a DACA recipient and being undocumented. And I think this is really dangerous. Um, this is because the conversation becomes heavily overtaken by DACA related issues. Meanwhile, the same injustices surrounding undocumented folk get completely pushed to the side. And thus like it renders it, it renders spaces for undocumented people uh, almost non-existent. So yes, like it is extremely frustrated. And yes, I was hesitant to speak out about this because for some time I felt like I was being selfish, but all of those feelings really go away when I start to realize that it's not just me. I'm not the only one going through this. Like there's so much more people out there um, who are feeling the exact same things. And I do not, I, I would also like to say that that guy is not a bad plan at all. Like some people just like come up to me and you're like, why are you always saying that you want DACA to end? Like do you not care about us? And it's not like that at all. Like, I'm super grateful for all the people who are able to attain those protections because being undocumented is truly heartaching. It's stressful, it's painful. And I know, like, I know that it is all these things and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, but DACA is not a solution and it does not fix our community's problems or injustices. You are right, Angel. I mean, you, and I wanna just say one thing for sure, you do honor all of us, you honor your mother and the sacrifices that she's made and you honor all of us here today because this fight that you're taking up is so important and we all need to listen to every one of you and your perspectives. So I really, really appreciate what you've shared with us today. Um, next, I'd like to go to Ola and Ola, 
Uh, you were valedictorian of your high school class in Michigan and graduated with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and women's studies from the University of Michigan. And your dream was to become an oncologist and save people's lives. But because of your status at the time, you didn't qualify for any financial assistance. How do you feel you've been limited in fulfilling your dreams and contributing to this country? Hi, thank you. Um, when I was getting ready to apply for medical school, um, what I came across was what I felt like were, um, was a lack of resources for undocumented students, really ambiguous or unclear um, acceptance policies for undocumented students specifically. And in addition to that, I felt like there was um, very little to no financial guidance or support for students like myself. And then um, at the time, I also, you know, had been undocumented for so long. It had been you know, like 18 years, and I had been reporting, my family and I had been reporting to ICE for over a decade. So when you couple that with also having been detained and almost deported back in high school, I had come to a point where I was physically and mentally just completely exhausted. Um, I hadn't really taken the time to process all of that um, systematic trauma and also like some of the ICE episodes that I had endured and I really needed to take, make space and take some time to process that and go through everything that I had gone through and get out of that fight or flight mode that I had been living in for so long, which I think so many people that are undocumented can relate to. Um, so that's where I was at, um, at the point after I graduated. So I made some space to do those things and I dedicated quite a few years now, several years to the time to just to heal process and move forward. And I found different ways to contribute to my community and pursue my passions. I work for a um, healthcare company that provides Medicaid services and we strive to provide high quality resource, resources in, a, um, in underserved communities. Well, thank you, Ola, for your story and for your service. And, you know, I don't think people think too much about the kind of stress and trauma that people who are undocumented live in. And, you know, just the idea of, you know, feeling somehow that you are um, here illegally and have to deal with law enforcement and have to deal with restrictions takes a big toll on families and your emotions. And I know uh, Yadira, you too have had a lot of this same kind of experience. I mean, you were born in our neighboring state of Sonora. We live in the Sonora desert region, um, but you faced a lot of family separation. I mean, first when your mother migrated here to reunite with your dad, you left your grandparents, I'm sure other family members behind. You remember your abuelito, your grandfather calling you chapis as a child. Um, and then when you were in college, your dad was deported and your abuelito passed away. What was it like to experience that, your father being deported? And were you able to see your family in Sonora when your grandfather passed away? Um, no. So it was spring break of college in 2010. Luckily, it was 2010 that spring break because I was off of school. Otherwise, I don't think I would have survived that semester. Um, but basically, my dad got pulled over and, you know, it was in 2010. And like Michael mentioned uh, previously, it was like right in the midst of, you know, oh, thank you, baby. Of the, thank you, Mimon. Sorry, I have my five year old with me right now. Um, but he got pulled over and detained into immigration. You know, it was in the heat of the immigration movement here in Arizona. So anybody that basically got detained for whatever reason pulled over would um, get, you know, they may have restructured their status. Um, my dad got detained two days later. My grandfather had been sick for a while, so he passed away. Um, and it was just heart-wrenching, you know, because like 
you didn't know what to focus on did, did I focus on my dad's being detained and trying to like figure out how to keep him in the U.S. or did I focus on my grandfather just like passing away and um it was definitely hard and it's still very hard you know to like recall it because I was very close to them um and unfortunately no I didn't get to see my family um when my grandfather passed away um but he's remembered you know and still lives in my heart um but yeah, it was a very surreal situation to go through because having at the point, I was still very involved um, within the nonprofits and the immigration fight in Arizona. And um, it happened to me and it just, I kind of froze, you know, I didn't know what to do. And I felt like I should have been more prepared and I tried, but you know, it just didn't work out. And my dad still got deported. Um, he signed a voluntary departure because he's like, I can't be detained with all of this going on. So he didn't feel that he had a choice. What and kind of work was your father doing? So vividly, what kind of work was your father doing here? Uh, landscaping at the time. Um, I recall trying to get him not detained and the um, verbiage that the immigration officer used was, he doesn't have any ties to the US. Um, mm -hmm. So mom and I didn't count because we were also undocumented. Uh, he owned a home, but you know, that didn't count. All of his immediate family, his sisters, his mom are in the US, but that didn't count either. Um, nothing counted. And his verbiage was literally, he has no ties to the US. <laughs> I was yeah. like, okay. Yeah, the injustice um, that we see is just overwhelming. And, you know, I really appreciate you telling us that part of your story, because it is important for people to understand the stress and the um, kind of challenges that you face every day when you live in the country um, without a legal status. Um, Michael, in 2012, you became a DACA recipient, but it wasn't until 2016 that you were able to join the service and adjust your status. So now, I mean, technically you're living the American dream, um, but there are many dreamers waiting to do the same. What do you think a pathway to citizenship for dreamers would mean to them and to this country? How would it impact their lives and the lives of this country? Yes, Lisa, I, I became involved in 2010, and uh, just right now, listening to everybody's stories is uh, bringing back a lot of memories. Um, being, in, being involved uh, impacted me, right, uh, emotionally. Uh, it's been uh, daunting uh, to the family. Uh, I heard uh, several words here uh, from our panelists, like mixed status families, uh, having ties in the U.S. Uh, I heard Angel. Uh, saying right that he feels uh, that he has to justify feeling deemed less than worthy and uh, uh, the reality is that our contributions as immigrants are are beyond uh, uh, recognizable right uh, they, they they are enormous to our communities um, but uh, I know that a, a pathway to citizenship uh, even legal residency would bring comfort to families uh, to those uh, very youth who are currently fighting for, for uh, DACA immigration reform. Uh, I, I believe that a, a pathway to citizenship would bring uh, uh, security to, to our families, first and foremost. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, the, the contributions would just be enormous continuously beyond what they are already today. Uh, I can tell you that for myself and my family, uh, my parents uh, did not earn their, their residency until about two, three years ago. Um, but even now, there's, there's days when I still think about past experiences getting pulled over by, by Phoenix Police Department, being pulled over by Border Patrol, and uh, having to share my own story about, uh, about how my family was a contributing family to, to our communities. And um, I, I believe that our, our contributions to to our, to, to our country, right, would be just enormous. Uh, we're already taxpayers. Uh, I heard uh, essential workers uh, today, right? Uh, we are already essential workers, right? We are, there's farm workers. We, are, we have families contributing already as it is. 
Uh, we have our uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, I believe though that a pathway to, to citizenship would just be recognizable of all the talent and uh, hard work that, that we have right now back in the States. Um, I think first and foremost, it would be, it would bring aid to our families emotionally. I am and a tremendous asset to this country. Look at what you're doing. I mean, all of you are contributing in so many beautiful ways, including serving in the armed services. And I remember Senator McCain, you make me think about, about our beloved Senator McCain when I was talking to him about the new immigration bill that he was trying to pass, I think it was 2013. Um, and we talked about, you know, the pathway to citizenship. And he said, you have to include citizenship, Lisa, we have to include it because that's when people really learn the rights and responsibilities associated with this country and they become the best citizens of any citizens we have. And I thought, you know, that is so true. So many people who fully appreciate what it means and uh, that is clearly represented in all of you. Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit about your testimony 10 years ago at the first hearing for the DREAM Act. I mean, first of all, what was that like for you? And obviously since that time, you've been able to adjust your status. What opportunities do you feel you have now that you have legal status? And what do you think that pathway to citizenship would do to help others who are in limbo? Um, well, I think that um, it would be great to be able to remember that day, but I think I'm probably blacked out and I can't remember anything that happened that day. So um, I will get back to you on that one. Um, as far as what um, a pathway to legal citizenship would provide for other undocumented individuals, I think, um, like Michael said, it really, I think, would provide that space to start that healing process. And also it would allow space to start thinking about future state because so much of what we live through every day is present state, getting through the next moment and worrying about the things that you can control and not focusing so much on the things that you cannot control, like your status at that point. So I think that for so many of us that have adjusted um, our stat, have been able to adjust status, um, it's been a privilege to be able to create that space and to start that healing process and to start being able to plan for our futures. And that is, I think, the goal for everyone. Everyone deserves to live with that type of dignity and everyone deserves to be able to be autonomous in selecting what their future looks like. Absolutely. Thank you, Ola. And Jose, you've been such a strong advocate for dreamers for such a long time. I understand you interrupted President Obama in one of his speeches when he was announcing the DAPA program, Deferred Action for Parents. Um, when you had already had your DACA status. Tell us about your commitment to this fight um, and a pathway to citizenship for the undocumented community. Uh, tell us about how you risked so much, even your own status. Um, well, something that um, Yadira and, uh, has mentioned about deportation. I, I was 10 years old when my, my dad was deported and I remember vaguely, I remember how, like Phoenix police came to my house I remember when he was arrested. And I remember like, it, I don't know, it took a month or two months for you to come back and, and there were coyotes and there were guns. Um, and I was, I was afraid. And I don't remember a lot of 10 to 12 years old. I don't remember that time. Um, so for me, I never want to feel like that again. I felt powerless. I was a little kid. I remember praying in a corner. And I hate to see how a lot of young people, a lot of children are going through that same thing again. So wow, I was uh, nervous. I was afraid. I didn't want to. Um, I don't like public speaking a lot, and I didn't want to interrupt the president. But for me, it was that was an opportunity to bring some safety, some certainty to my parents, to the parents of Yadira, to a lot of the folks, and and I just have that. I just hate to see people suffer, specifically children, for things that doesn't make sense to me. It's people are just trying to make a better life for themselves. Um, oftentimes people are feeling violence, poverty, and they're looking for an opportunity and we deny them that. And it's really, really upsetting and heartbreaking to see how, how that trauma lives on with you. And as Hola was talking about, it's, it's the healing process that 
that the community has not had. It's, there's been years and years and years of, of trauma. And for me, it's, my hope is that we can get to heal the healing process soon because you can't start healing um, without having the acknowledgement and the safety to do so. Um, you, you have to live day by day and it's, it's exhausting. Uh, and to me, that's why I'm so grateful for the relationship that I built because, because of that, I, I don't feel like I'm alone and that has been able to sustain us moving forward. Yeah, Jose, it is so unjust and it is um, heartbreaking, as you said, to um, know that you've experienced that kind of family separation and trauma from police when your families are here making a difference for all of us and, and working within our communities. Is your father back with you now? Yeah, he, he was able to come back. And thankfully, that that was a different, it was easier to come. Um, but as, as Michael said, every time there's a police behind you, every time there is highway patrol or any law enforcement, even if it's security, <laughs> approaches you, uh, you, you, you have to freeze. It, it, it just, everything starts coming up. And, and when we were able to get driver's license here in Arizona, that was um, such an incredible moment because that was a time I felt like I don't have to worry about myself now. I can, I have to worry about my parents, but at least I don't have to worry about myself. And, and that that has been such a big adjustment that I know a lot of people who are undocumented, a lot of our youth don't have that. And a lot of our adults don't have that. So for me, it's like simple things like that mean so much. It changes your whole perception of the day because it's just, it just feels so nice to just drive and not worry about it. Yeah, there's, so, there's still so much injustice in this system that we need to, to fix. So um, Angel, I'm going to let you have the last question before we go to your closing statements. I understand that you and your mom left Mexico to escape poverty and violence. And here you are, you're a Barrett Honor student, you excelled in high school. Um, when was it that you actually realized you were undocumented? And what barriers do you face to getting that higher education now and pursuing your dream to having this better life? Yes, so uh, growing up, I knew I was undocumented, or at least I partly felt uh, what it meant to be undocumented in a way. So in elementary school, my mother had to talk with me that one talk every immigrant child is so afraid of, and it's not the talk when you get a girlfriend, it's the deportation <laughs> talk. The This is what we're gonna do if I don't come home one day. And that to me and to any child, honestly, is very traumatic. If my mom would be late anywhere, if she was, um, if I was at school and she hadn't picked me up in like 20 minutes, 10, five minutes, I would start to panic because I didn't know what to do. Like, I was like, oh my God, am I going to be separated from my family today? Is this the day that my mom was talking about? And sadly, that was not all that it was. Um, maybe if it were, it would be a little better, but that's not all that it is being undocumented. The terror really doesn't stop there. I really feel like I understood what it meant to be undocumented when I entered my first year at Metro Tech High School. Um, that was the point when I realized that I was more different than I initially thought. Unlike my friends, they were able to get driver's license. Instead, I would shake and my heart would feel heavy every time I would look at an authority, a police officer. Like um, I would like not be able to drive sometimes just because I couldn't deal with all the stress and all the anxiety. So while most of my peers and friends were able to get work permits. I would have to work under the table landscaping. And these were all uh, methods of adapting that I took upon just to try to get over this barrier. But I often think, why do I have to do this? Why is it me? Why did the world choose me to go through this? And it wasn't until I joined and heard about organizations like Aliento that I was like, wait, it's not just me. There's so much more people out there going through this. And that also made me feel better, but it also, it was a bittersweet feeling because it also made me feel bad in the way of like, whoa, like, you know what I'm going through and I know how much it hurts. So you must know how much it hurts. And also most of my time in high school consisted of me asking myself the one question, the, am I going to be able to go to college? And the truth is that despite everything I did, it never felt like what I was doing was enough. Even now, um, I graduated with a 4.7 GPA. I took all the AP and honors courses that my high school offered. That still didn't feel like enough. 
uh, sleepless nights, doing scholarship applications, that didn't feel like enough. Um, I did sports. I became president of uh, various honor society clubs at my high school, and that still didn't feel like enough. I decided to go above and beyond. I recognized that to fulfill my dreams, I would have to work 10 times as hard as everybody else. And even when doing so, I felt like I was not doing enough. And partly, I feel like that's because we live in a society that always tells us like, hey, you like fix your papers or when are you gonna adjust? And that just makes it feel like there's something wrong with us. Like we need to fix something from within us when in reality, it shouldn't be like that because there's nothing wrong with us as because we, there, we shouldn't have to be paying a price to live our dreams or to have a prosperous life. Nevertheless, I have full confidence that dreamers adapt. We have been and continue to every day. And facing that reality of having to work 10 times as hard as everybody else was only a portion of what um, is granted to others effort. Well, sorry, um, like having to work 10 times as hard was really frustrating. And partly it was because others would get stuff effortlessly and then I would have to work 10 times as hard and still not be eligible. But in all honesty, like my dreams of becoming an engineer, being an attorney, studying law, and giving back to my family and community was my motivation. That's what worked for me. And all I can say is that I'm really grateful for these hardships because they've made me the person that I am today. Well, okay, not only is there not anything wrong with you, but we are all incredibly proud of all of you and everything that you've accomplished. I, I listen to your stories. I know people on this webinar listen to all of your stories and are really in awe of everything that you've accomplished despite the hardships that you've faced. And so it's time, it's time Reina for us to pass the DREAM Act. And I know we may be running a little short on time. So I don't know Reina, if you wanna make sure that we have this strong call to action now for all of us to engage and make sure that we pass um, the immigration reform as a whole, as Angel mentioned, it's not just the DREAM Act. That's a big, big step that we think we can get over the finish line, but we definitely need to push for comprehensive immigration reform to make sure that everyone who is here, who is living with that undocumented status is given that right to live here legally. Reina, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, Lisa, I appreciate it. As you said it, these, these stories are just a little glimpse of the 11 million undocumented folks that have multiple difference of status in our, in our country. And beyond, beyond the heartbreak, beyond the challenges, like we've been able to thrive and we've been able to see that, that, that we have to figure out a way forward. And that has, sometimes has been out of necessity. And if you are listening today or maybe later on, this is the moment, it's been 20 years of inaction. We know that it's it's gonna be crucial that we, that we get your support. I feel that like year after year, uh, we come back and we share the stories, but stories are human lives. And as Michael said, it's essential workers. It's, it's not only dreamers, but right now we have a clear opportunity that there has been legislation already passed in the House of Representatives that can, be passed in the Senate and we need to make sure that we're working together to get it through the finish line. So we are launching today. We are all Arizona campaign to ensure that, that folks have an opportunity to, to take action with us and join us. We know that, um, that with this, we're asking you to do three things that are very simple and that you can do from the comfort of your home. We're asking you to join and promote the campaign. We are Arizona. Uh, we know that uh, it is in the hands of the Senate. So we want to make sure that you are understanding that, that it is the moment for us to join together. Two, invite, to, invite dreamers and members of the community to speak about it. It is super crucial that the most impacted communities have an opportunity to, to really do that. And then more than anything, making sure that you are contacting your senators. If you are in Arizona, we're asking you to contact Senator Kelly and Senator Sinema uh, to tell them that we need a pathway to citizenship, but we need it now. There's so many conversations happening right now, but we're asking you to please do that. Take the time to email them. We have actually developed a toolkit for you. So it's really easy. We're going to be dropping it in the chat and also on Facebook Live. It's going to be super easy, alientoaz.org 
org forward slash we are Arizona dash toolkit. So that's going to be in our website where you can download images uh, from impacted community and be sharing it out to be inviting us uh, to speak and to making sure that this is not something that we're going to be here talking about it 20 years from now. So we're counting with you. And with that, we do have a couple of words um, from former Senator Bob Worsley, because we know that we are not alone in this and we want to make sure that we understand that there's people who who are allies and right now just just like I invited you to join us uh, we have allies that have our back and now more than ever we need to make sure that um, that you're speaking up so then we're not here 20 years from now as I was mentioning at the beginning uh, I am a DACA recipient myself and having to deal with that uncertainty was one of my main motivations of founding Aliento so we can begin our healing journey but just in the words of Jose, we cannot begin the healing without the acknowledgement. So we have to acknowledge the pain, the uncertainty, but we have to be radical with our hope. Hope can be a tricky emotion and can be something that I find myself uh, meditating and praying about, but it is that hope that we can hold on to, to remember that a hope can be turned into, into something actionable. And right now, if you were moved, as I was seeing in the chat, uh, if you are a parent, if you are a business leader, if you are a student, there is a place where we can have hope that you don't have to be have a 4.0 in order for you to have opportunities. Because in the United States, we have that promise of being the land of opportunity and, and be rooted in freedom. So what if we were to close our eyes and really imagine what would it look for all of us to be free and to be holding on to that hope? So with that, I'm going to uh, pass it over from some a couple of words from Senator Worsley. And after that, we're going to be closing it up and having some opportunity to have questions from, from the panel. As a former Arizona State Senator and a devout Mormon, I ran against and defeated Senate President Russell Pierce, author of SB 1070, or Show Me Your Papers Bill. I've also had some success in business. I founded SkyMall when I was 35, back in 1989, and I sold it to Rupert Murdoch in 2001. In 2012, I was recruited to run, and I defeated Russell Pierce by 12%. I demonstrated that being pro-immigrant is a winning strategy, even in a Republican primary. My love for the Hispanic people comes from many years working with them in my church. I consider them some of my best friends, thousands who do not have documents to be here, but have settled down, raised a family, and paid taxes for many years. I retired from the Senate in 2019 and then researched, wrote, and published a book called The Horseshoe Virus about how Arizona became the immigration epicenter. After hearing about my book, Senator Mitt Romney introduced me to the American Business Immigration Coalition, or ABIC, to continue my efforts to advance common sense, bipartisan immigration reform, and I agreed to organize an Intermountain chapter of ABIC, comprising Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, and Colorado. Just a few weeks ago, ABIC and Aliento fought hard to pass a referendum that will give Arizonans the opportunity to vote on providing in-state tuition to Dreamers in 2022. This was the first pro-immigrant reform passed through the Arizona legislature in probably 30 years and marks a dramatic departure from the Russell Pierce era of bigotry and discrimination. As a member of my church, I believe strongly in the importance of protecting and advocating for minorities, immigrants, and underserved populations. I'm thankful for powerful Mormon lawmakers like Michelle Udall, who co-sponsored with Aliento the Arizona legislation. We urge Republican senators in Washington to follow us as we advocate for these immigrants. Right now is the time to lift our dreamers out of the shadows and legalize our ag workers who are working so hard to keep food on our tables and make sure all of our crops are healthy and productive and harvested. We're here to say that in 2021, this is the year to start building a bipartisan, productive, 
and modern immigration system. There's huge support by American voters for dreamers, farm workers, and essential workers. And there's a responsibility for elected officials to move forward. Let's push them. Let's encourage them to do what's right. Do the right thing and pass this legislation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody who joined us. Now we're gonna be opening up from questions from the media and from, and from the attendees. And we're gonna start with the first question. Uh, but before that, uh, as former Senator Worsley said, the time is now. So we're gonna be having a couple of questions and then we're officially gonna be wrapping up. So the first question is actually in Spanish and I'm gonna say it in Spanish and then I'm gonna translate it so then folks can understand it. And if we can get some of our panelists to answer that in Spanish, that would be wonderful. So the question comes from Daniela at Univision. ¿Cuál es el impacto que esta incertidumbre de sus estatus migratorios ha tenido en su salud mental y emocional? What is the emotional and mental health impact that, that your immigration status has had, has had on you? So if we can potentially go with um, with Jose, do you want to take that? En español, por favor. Sí. Um, eh, como, como mencionamos, uh, el impacto mental y emocional es de que sientes de que vales menos. Uh, siempre hay esta incertidumbre donde no importa lo que yo haga, nunca va a ser suficiente. Uh, porque el sistema aquí te, te dice de que no no calificas para una licencia, no calificas para un tipo de trabajo, no calificas para colegiaturas estatales, no calificas para todo esto. Y al mismo tiempo siempre estás en el, el miedo y la incertidumbre de que te pueden separar de tu familia. Entonces esos traumas se quedan contigo y te afectan. Uh, para mí me afectó en, en la forma donde tenía muchos uh, problemas con, con rencor y enojo, uh, donde apenas unos cuantos años he empezado a, 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 a trabajar uh, en terapia para no sentirme así, sentirme diferente, sentirme de que yo tengo valor como persona. Uh, y creo que mucha de la comunidad sigue pasando por esto, uh, donde tienen, es de día a día, sobrevivir el siguiente día. Y al mismo tiempo, uh, creo que esto es un estado sistemático haciéndolo, destrozando nuestras familias. Me gustaría a mí creer en, en un futuro donde no tengamos que pasar de esta mismos traumas cada día. Anyone else from the panelists who would like to answer about the mental health impact? I know Ola and Yadira, you talked a little bit about that. Um, okay, uh, so it's es difficult. Um, te levantas el día y En tu mente lo que primero que piensas es seguir tu vida, pero al mismo tiempo siempre está atrás de ti en tu mente. Uh, y si pasa esto y si pasa lo otro, um, Ángel habló sobre el plan que tienes que tener um, si llega a pasar algo. Después del 2010 aquí, cuando pasó lo de la SB1070, recuerdo que... Um, hicimos un toque para las familias para que se prepararan. Si pasa esto, estos son los pasos que van a pasar. Si tienes hijos, aquí es el poder uh, para que X persona te uh, cuide tus hijos, uh, para que X persona pueda tener acceso a tus propiedades, a tus cuentas bancarias y todo eso. Entonces eh, eh, es un trauma que a diario vives Y a la misma vez en veces se hace como repetitivo y es triste cuando este trauma ya es como parte de ti. Um, ahora que tengo un hijo de cinco años, en veces digo yo entre mí, tengo DACA por dos años, ¿qué va a pasar en dos años? ¿Verdad? Porque ya no, ya no nomás soy yo, entonces ya ahora también es un niño de cinco años. Um, igual con mi familia, pues mis papás, ¿verdad? Al pasar del tiempo, um, no, no se están poniendo más jóvenes, <ríe> voy a decir, ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿qué es lo que va a pasar el día de mañana? Um, entonces, es, es difícil. 
um, pero igual como dijo Reina, ¿verdad? Siempre hay um, una fe que nos mueve adelante. Um, como dijo Michael también, nuestra comunidad es resilient, no sé exactamente cómo traducir eso, um, pero siempre le echamos ganas hacia adelante, pero en veces te cansas de echarle ganas hacia adelante. Gracias, Yadira. We have a question from Alisa Resnick from the Arizona Public Media. Uh, she paraphrased about saying 20 years since the first, it's been 20 years since the first dream at hearing. What are some of the protections that are available for other members of mixed immigration status families and how have conversations among mixed immigration status, status families changed over the years? So any of the panelists would want to take that? Maybe Ola or Michael, I know that um, that you adjusted your status and you probably grew up in a mixed immigration status family. Do you have any insight if you have seen any of those changes? Um, let's say, uh, I know Michael, you mentioned 2010 when you first got involved. Ola, you were, you kind of share a little bit about having that blackout experience at the Dream Act hearing in 2011. What has changed since then from your perspective? Um, from my perspective, um, it changes every time we change administrations. Um, during the Trump era, I think um, what my family and I experienced was a bit harsher um, treatment, maybe by ICE and by other law enforcement officials. Um, in addition to that, uh, now with the Biden administration, um, what we've seen in my family has been um, more uh, dignity being interwoven within the policies um, pertaining to ICE and how they handle family separation. So um, it's, again, this bolsters that point that it's very tumultuous and it's very um, difficult to exist as an undocumented person because of the fact that things change on a daily basis. And it's hard to foster stability and hope and maintain hope when that is the case. Thank you. Michael, anything that you would want to add? Um, yes, uh, I would actually like to go to the previous question uh, answered in Spanish if possible. Este, uh, para empezar, no, estas son mis opiniones y no las del ejército, no, siendo, estando aquí en, en Corea del Sur, pero um, quisiera, quisiera nada más este, hacerles no saber, no, re, haciendo reflexión en los, en los últimos 10 años. Uh, yo pude obtener mi residencia en el 2017 uh, y este últimamente me enlisté en el ejército. Uh, pude obtener mi ciudadanía en 2019, pero desde el momento que me enlisté hasta el momento que estuve yo en mi primera base estacionado en Virginia al día de hoy, este las historias de nuestras familias uh, con estatus mixto, ¿no? Uh, so, todavía persisten, ¿no? aún, aún estando en el ejército, tengo soldados yo que uh, vienen de, de varias, uh, de varias uh, áreas ¿no? de, 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 del mundo, ¿no? del globo, y cada, cada familia inmigrante ¿no? tiene una historia. Uh, yo me acuerdo que cada vez que yo salía uh, de cada viaje hasta que mi familia pudo obtener su residencia, tenía que preparar un paquete, tenía que pre preparar un paquete de información de qué pasaría si mamá, papá fueran deportados, uh, quién se quedaría con mis hermanas, mi hermano, mi, mi casa, uh, nuestras propiedades, ¿no? lo poco que tenemos. Uh, y eso te afecta personalmente, te afecta men mentalmente, te afecta emocionalmente. Y hasta el día de hoy uh, me afecta a mí personalmente también. Uh, aún teniendo residencia, ciudadanía ahora, este... Uh, y estando en uniforme, uh, que, es, que es un poco peculiar, ¿no? Uh, cada vez que tengo un, una confrontación con, con la policía, ¿no? Uh, mis manos, mis, mis palmas sudan porque, porque me acuerdo, ¿no? De, 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 nuestra, de, de lo que ha pasado en, en, el, en los últimos años. Um, so yo, yo lo que diría, ¿no? Que, que lo más importante que hay aquí es crear esos espacios esos espacios, espacios para nuestras familias, nuestros estudiantes, nuestros streamers, para poder este, uh, dar sus, sus testimonios, ¿no? sus historias. Uh, al fin del día, el movimiento persiste solo por nuestros, nuestras historias y, y la disciplina que tenemos de poder seguir adelante. 
Uh, pero, pero personalmente les puedo decir que aún siendo ya un ciudadano yo, uh, mi familia no pudo obtener su residencia hasta que pude yo hacer una petición por ellos uh, para poder uh, cuidar de ellos, protegerlos en sí. Uh, las oportunidades son muy cortas aún, aún uh, para nuestras familias inmigrantes. Y yo lo que diría que lo más importante que, que, que tenemos que hacer es continuar organizando. Uh, aún estando yo aquí al otro lado del mundo, les puedo decir que yo, yo, puedo, yo puedo ver el, el trabajo que ustedes hacen en sus comunidades y este, hay que seguir siendo persistentes. Muchas gracias, Michael. Y tenemos ya la última pregunta de las redes sociales. We have the last question now coming from, uh, from folks. And this is going to be in English and in Spanish. So I'm going to pass it over to Jose and Angel so you can uh, pay extra attention to me. I'm pulling out my teacher background right now. So I'm going to say it in English and Spanish. And Jose and Angel, if you can uh, share it in both languages, that would be great. So the question is, can you tell us about what is the status of the DREAM Act? We've been using that word for the whole, for the whole time here. Tell us where's the status and what are some of the plans to, to really advocate right now, especially Angel, if you can really crystallize. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the difference of DACA and DREAM Act and why it's important uh, that we talked about like who would qualify under the DREAM Act. So what is the status and what are some of the plans to make sure that this bill um, Get it to the finish line, and I'm going to say it in Spanish. Nos pueden decir cuál es el estatus en que en donde está el Dream Act en este momento en Washington D.C. y qué planes tienen ustedes para seguir luchando por este proyecto de ley. Um, well, I start. Um, the the Dream Act is stuck in the Senate. I think this is something that we have seen uh, throughout the years. Uh, it passes. It passed in the House with the. HR6, the Dream and Promise Act, but it's right now stuck in the Senate. Uh, there's two main vehicles that could go through. One of them would be through uh, reconciliation, uh, if making sure that if it's considered a budgetary issue, um, there will be, you get all the Democrats and probably be happy sometime in October or September. Uh, and then the other one would be is we can overcome the filibuster. We can get 10 Republicans to agree with 50 Democrats at least then we can potentially pass it out. Um, but we have seen that in the past, as Michael and Yadira and all of our referring to 2010 when, when the Dream Act failed because we were not able to overcome the filibuster. So uh, this is where it's at right now. Um, want me to say in Spanish? Okay. Ahorita um, el acta sueño o el Dream Act pasó en la Cámara Baja y está estancado ahorita en el Senado. Hay dos formas de que pueda pasar. Una es de que si puede arrastrar 60 votos que necesita para que pueda pasar el, el famoso filibuster, donde necesitas uh, 60 senadores que votan a favor. Uh, si tienes a 50 demócratas, más mínimo 10 republicanos para que pueda suceder. En el pasado, la última vez que se votó fue en el 2010, no pudimos hablar los 60 votos. Uh, la otra forma es, se llama reconciliación. Es un procedimiento um, que trabaja en el Senado donde agarras a la mayoría, eh, que es 50 votos más uno, 51 votos, uh, y lo puede pasar. Uh, pero el problema es de que si se puede considerar un tema de inmigración como uh, parte del, del presupuesto federal. Aquí es lo que se está debatiendo. Entonces, ahorita lo que queremos hacer nosotros es seguir presionando a nuestros senadores. Hay congresistas para que puedan, uh, de que no estemos viendo en este tipo de, de limbo uh, por mucho tiempo. Uh, también querí, uh, quería añadir que siempre escucho esa, esa pregunta de que, qué puedo hacer yo como individuo para ayudar al movimiento y probablemente lo que diría yo o lo que siempre digo es promover la conciencia en la sociedad, asegurarse que la gente entienda lo que significa ser indocumentado a contrario a lo que significa ser uh, un, una persona con DACA porque aunque tener DACA no es algo definitivo es mejor que ser indocumentado y ha habido muchas ocasiones donde um, me enfrento a personas y por pensar, que yo, ser, por, por pensar que yo soy un soñador, tengo DACA y en realidad no es así. Porque uh, cuando las personas tienen un estatus de DACA y dicen que son indocumentados, confunde mucho a las personas. Entonces cuando vean a alguien que tenga DACA y diga que es indocumentado, corregirlos porque eso hace que la gente indocumentada Um, se, ponen, se pongan al lado en la conversación como estamos aquí, como en la conversación que estamos teniendo aquí y incluso también uh, confunde mucho a nuestros aliados y a nuestros legisladores 
que es probablemente lo más importante porque si nuestros legisladores están confundidos, eh, eso no es bueno para nosotros, no es bueno para nadie. Y pues para terminar, nomás quise, quería decir que al principio, um, la verdad sí odiaba ser diferente, pero con el tiempo aprendí a aceptar mi realidad y verla como un, retro, un retroso que trabajar um, duro para superar. Y eso es lo que tenemos que hacer todos porque sí es un retroso, sí es um, una cosa que tenemos que, um, en la que tenemos que triunfar, pero en realidad um, no más a promover la, uh, promoviendo la conciencia se puede aliviar muchas cosas. Angel, do you want to say that in English? Uh, just a little bit, a, a summary, summarized version? Yes, of course. So um, what I was saying in Spanish is that um, what I believe it to be the most important is spreading awareness because it is extremely important for people to understand what it means to be undocumented, contrary to what it means to hold DACA status. Um, this is really important because when people say that they, are, they have DACA status, no, sorry, when people say that they are undocumented, but in reality they have DACA status, it confuses our allies, it confuses our communities, and it confuses our lawmakers. And that is dangerous because our lawmakers need to be able to distinguish between the two people, between DACA and undocumented. Um, the most, it's most impactful because when uh, lawmakers think that by being a dreamer, you're DACA, it pushes out everybody who's undocumented. It pushes them to the side, it shuns them out, and they lose part in taking place in the political conversation and political spaces. So that's why it's very important to be able to distinguish. And if you ever hear someone say, oh, I have DACA, but I'm undocumented, that's not the same thing. Having DACA is not the absolute best, but it's way, well, way better than being undocumented. So just being able to distinguish between those two things is really important. Thank you so much, Angel, and thank you so much to our panelists for being part of this very important conversation. We know that we're not covering every single thing, but we wanted to be this a star. And as Angel uh, said it today, there is a call to action. You can do something about it. So definitely check out our toolkit at, at alientoac.org. We are Arizona slash toolkit. And if you are outside of Arizona, there's also resources for you to get involved. Um, lastly, if there are some members of the media, that you want to have follow-up questions, please be in communication with us in case if you want to do an individual interview, we will make sure that we can coordinate that. And with that, this concludes our, uh, our panel conversation, a roundtable of 20 years of uncertainty with our American dreamers. Thank you all so much for being here today. And let's remember we're not alone and the moment to act is now. We don't want to be having these panel conversations again 20 years from now. Let's ensure that people like Jose, Yadira, Angel, and the close to 1.5 million dreamers that have both DACA and are undocumented, as Angel really presents that, have an opportunity to really have certainty and begin their healing journey. Thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs>